So hello everyone, good afternoon, welcome, welcome. It's my pleasure to have you all here for the first of this spring's UT Dallas Center for Children and Families Spring Lecture Series. This is our 13th year of spring lectures. And as I know you're all aware and experiencing right now, it will be our first to deliver our spring lecture series in this virtual format. Now I, and I expect the rest of you, many of you who've been to our lectures before, will be missing our chance to greet old friends and meet new ones as we share some coffee before and after the lecture and refreshments. But we're finding new ways to reach out and to exchange the latest in research with applications for advancing the healthy development of children and families. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to just point out on your screens the Q&A box. Um, please use the Q&A box to, as you're listening to the lecture today, to list your questions for our speaker. And as we have time towards the end of her talk, um, I'll be sharing those questions with her. And please add anything you want and we'll get to more of them later if we don't have time for them today. So it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Megan Swanson. Dr. Swanson is an assistant professor of psychology at UT Dallas. She received her PhD in behavioral neuroscience from the graduate city at the City University of New York. And she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's Carolina Institute for Developmental Disabilities. Here at UTD, she directs the Baby Brain Lab. The lab uses multi-method approaches to understand the developing child. She includes neuroimaging, eye tracking, cognitive assessments, and home language recorders. Dr. Swanson's research is funded by an NIH K99ROO, a KRU Pathway to Independence Award. And she was awarded the University of Texas System Rising Stars Award. Dr. Swanson is a very active contributor to CCF's group, the Center for Children and Families group of faculty affiliates. She's generating, helping us to generate new outreach and research initiatives. Today, she's going to share lessons from her research and the title, as you see, Talking to Babies, the Universal Ingredient for Language Learning. Dr. Swanson? Thank you, Dr. Owen, for that kind introduction and for the invitation to be a part of the CCF Spring Lecture Series. It's really an honor to be a part of this wonderful series, and I always look forward to the opportunity and challenge to talking with a group of audience that includes parents, uh, service providers, and academics. Um, I just want to make a quick plug for the next talk in the series as well, while I have everybody's attention. Um, the talk is by Selena Brody, and it's going to be held Friday, February 26th at 9.30. I'm mentioning this just because I think it's such an important topic. She'll be talking about how to discuss injustice to your children. At the onset, I also want to thank Rachel Berglund, who is the Assistant Director of CCF, and she is kind enough to be advancing my slides for today. So before I jump into my talk, a few formalities to get out of the way. And next slide, please. So the, um, the views and opinions that I expressed during this talk are mine and mine alone and do not necessarily reflect any official policies. Um, and I do not have any conflicts of interest to report today. Next slide. Just a quick roadmap of today's talk. Um, I'm going to be starting by a quick um, overview of the progression of how infants learn how to talk and going over some early milestones. We'll then um, move next into thinking about what are the mechanisms behind how infants actually undergo this tremendous feat. I call this inside the black box of learning to talk. Next, um, I'll talk about what I call the universal ingredient, which is uh, a caregiver speech, is a little spoiler alert there for you guys. And I'll share with you one of my recent research studies looking at infants with autism. And then I'll wrap up with um, recommendations for parents and anyone who spends time with infants. 
Uh, as uh, Dr. Owen mentioned, there'll be plenty of time at the end for Q&A, so please put your questions in, in the Q&A box as uh, we go along and we'll, we'll wrap those up at the very end. Next slide, please. All right, so um, as the title of this talk indicates, this is a talk about early language skills during infancy, and I most of my research really does focus on the first three years of life, so this is a, a point in time that I find incredibly interesting. Um, and the truth is, is that infants are on the path to developing language long before they say their first words, really at the earliest stages of life. So in the first few months of life, they uh, participate in a lot of reflexive vocalizations. So these could be cries or grunts or tongue clicks. Those reflexive vocalizations move into cooing and laughter, which then develops into um, babbling. So babbling actually undergoes a number of different transitions um, and becomes more sophisticated as infants develop. Early on, this could just sound like vocal play and they may be you know, using vowel-like or consonant-like sounds and they play with their intonation a fair bit. Somewhere after six months of age, infants um, reach a developmental milestone that we call canonical babbling. Um, and this is a specific type of babbling where there's consonant vowel or CV pairs that they repeat. So this is uh, examples like ba ba, na na, ga ga. And then the last sort of and most sophisticated form of babbling that infants uh, participate in is really what we call the jargon stage. And this is the babbling that when you hear it, it almost sounds like a conversation. So you may actually have back and forth with your infant. They may be kind of mimicking parts of your own speech. And all of this um, babbling is really setting infants up for the major milestone of the first year of life, and that's saying their first word. Um, and so, yeah, so that comes often sometimes around the, the first year of life, sometimes a little bit before and sometimes a little bit afterwards. And then by the time infants are 24 months of age, they have somewhere around 50 words and they may even start using short sentences, so short two to four word sentences. Next slide, please. So as I showed in my previous timeline, these earliest stages of language learning are actually quite slow, right? In some ways, it's like watching um, a long, arduous movie. When I was thinking this morning, Lord of the Rings came to my mind, right? So it's over three hours long. It takes forever. There's a few surprises that come along the way, and that's also the case with early language learning. So it may take up to 12 months for them to utter their first words, and then their second word may come a few weeks after that, their third, a couple of weeks after that. But at some point in time, this language learning really ramps up. And this is what we call the language explosion. So what I'm showing you here in this figure is um, data from a parent report measure that's called the MCDI. It's where we ask parents, do your infants say or understand uh, these some 300 words? And what you see on the y-axis here is the percent of words um, produced according to the MCDI, and then on the x-axis is age and months. And you can see it's pretty stable throughout the first year of life. So between 8 and 13 months, infants learn on average about two words a month. But sometime after 14 months, this really shifts into high gear, and the rate increases about sixfold. And even after, this is off the chart here, but after 18 months is when language really takes off and we see this language explosion. And this is really just a time period where infants are increasing the rate at which they're learning new words. Next slide. So the question then remains, you know, why is there just this strong emphasis on early language learning in the first few years of life? And why are there researchers like myself that are just really interested in understanding how this process takes place and what contributes to it? And the reason why there's so much interest and importance placed on early language learning is because early language skills are a harbinger for later development and academic outcomes. So we know from research that better early language skills are associated with better school readiness at kindergarten and long-term better academic outcomes, right? So these early skills are certainly important and predictive of a child's later development, and that's why there's such a strong emphasis placed here. So what this really means is that um, if, a, if a child is developing language well, they go into to preschool, in kindergarten, sorry, they go into kindergarten with good language skills are also more likely to go into preschool with 
better language skills and then go on to have better language skills later on into third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. Uh, next slide, please. So I've spent the first few minutes of my talk going over some of these early language milestones. And now is the point in time when we talk about mechanisms, right? So how is it that infants are learning language at this breakneck pace? Um, next slide. So this is um, a, a little infographic of an equation that I'm putting up here where we have a baby and then there's a black box, something that's happening. And then at the other end of the side of this equation is that at 18 years old, we know that most teenagers and young adults have somewhere between 40 and 60,000 spoken words, right? So this is an incredible amount of language development that's happening in 18 years. So how in the world is this happening? And how is this extraordinary feat really possible? So part of this explanation is likely that we as humans have some aspect of our brain development that's hardwired for language acquisition. So we're, we're probably uh, born with highly specialized mechanisms that tune us into word learning and help this process along. Next slide. So talking about language development is one of my favorite topics. Talking about brain development is my other favorite topic, but I promise there'll just be a few brain slides before we get back to pictures of cute babies. Um, so why, um, why talk about early brain development during this time period? So I already have um, crafted this story for you about how language development is really quite remarkable. And it turns out that brain development during the same time period is equally as remarkable. Um, so in terms of neurodevelopment, the first two years of life are truly unlike any other time in our lives as humans. And I really can't stress this enough. It is a unique time period for both dynamic growth and rapid growth. Um, and part of the unique nature of this time period is really just the sheer rate of brain development, just how fast the brain is growing. So when infants are two to four weeks old, so they're neonates at this point in time, right? Their brain is about 36% of the adult volume. And at 24 months, they're already at 83% the adult volume. So practice, practically what this means is that when you look at babies, they have giant heads in proportion to their bodies, right? And we've all probably noticed this with the little ones in our lives. So the next time that you're looking at your little toddler and you're struggling to get that t-shirt over the head, take a moment just to appreciate the magic that's going on in their skull in terms of this really unique time period. And we see um, this rapid brain development both on the overall scale of just brain size, but also when we look at the level of the individual neuron as well. And that's what I'm showing here in this lower figure on the right. So neurons go from immature to adult-like between birth and 2.5 years old. So I've highlighted in a red box here um, what it, this neuron looks like at 2.5 years old. And then just immediately to the right of that is the same neuron at 28 to 30 years. So you can see it looks pretty darn near like adult-like already by two and a half years old. Now, this doesn't mean that brain development is nearly done at 24 months of age. The brain actually still has a long journey to go in terms of refinement and specialization. For example, some white matter pathways in the brain don't reach peak maturity until the 30s, 40s, and beyond, right? So some of us still have some hope for, for reaching our peak maturity in terms of brain development. And I think of the white matter pathways as sort of like the brain's freeway system. So this is the, the, the parts of your brain that are connecting um, areas that are, are, are structurally further apart from one another and allows for rapid communication. So while the first two years of life is kind of unique in terms of dynamic and rapid brain growth, it's not the case that brain development is sort of done and over with at that time period. Um, next slide. So let's jump back uh, to language and talk about one study that I think is, is really cool um, that highlights this idea that we could have highly that specialized mechanisms for language quite early in life. And um, this is my last uh, slide of brains, I promise. Um, so this is uh, the top is slice, brain slices from an infant and the bottom is adults. And this is a coronal slice, so it's sort of like if you were taking a slice through the brain this way and looking down on the top of the brain. So at the top of the slides would be where the eyes are. 
And um, this is a study that's using functional neuroimaging. So it's measuring how the brain functions in response to different types of stimuli. And what they did was they showed, um, they, didn't show, they, they played for babies and adults um, language. So both forward speech and reverse speech and silence. And they looked at where was brain activation during this forward speech. And you can see in this panel of adults, there's these big red blobs that are um, showing up in, in what's um, the temporal part of the brain here. And that just means that there's a lot of activation in that area. And that makes a lot of sense because those are the regions of the brain that we think about being important for language in adults. Um, and what you see is that even though the blobs aren't as big in the baby brains at the top, you still see activation in those same temporal regions. But keep in mind that this is activation in those regions long before an infant is saying their first word, right? So our brains are set up to process and understand language and key into language far long before we're actually talking and using spoken language ourselves. Next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so um, is that it? Did I solve our equation? Is the brain just the black box in the middle and that's it? Um, it, it turns out that no, it's not quite that simple. Um, and I would argue that brain is part of the equation, but it's not contributing everything, right? So we need actually things like input in addition to our brain development to help um, support this early language development. Next slide. So the real model probably looks a little bit more complex. It's probably, probably even more complex than this, but this is just to give you an idea about how researchers like myself have been conceptualizing this lately. So we have a baby that has behavior, right? So they may cry or um, laugh or do any number of different things. And that behavior is going to be um, driving how parents respond to them, right? A baby cries, their parents goes and picks them up. That's actually a bi-directional relationship though. So the way that parents interact with their infants also influences how infants react to their parents going forward, right? So, and this is, you know, well-founded in the attachment literature. But likewise, um, the brain is sort of in the middle part of this feedback loop as well, right? So our brain is developing and changing in response to our environment. Um, and our brain also, you know, dictates how we respond to different stimuli, right? If our brain isn't mature enough, we're not gonna be talking in full sentences. Um, and the last piece of this is really this, this relationship between the caregiver and the child's brain. And I'll, I'll get to this um, in, a, in a little bit towards the end of my talk in our future directions. And this idea that it could actually be the case that caregiver speech or how parents and caregivers are talking to babies is actually helping to shape brain development as well. So the model's not quite so simple, but we have a little bit more information on what's inside the black box now than we did probably 20 years ago. Next slide. All right, so the brain is part of this black box of what helps infants learn language, but the other piece is really related to input, right? So what do infants experience and, and, and how is that related to the, what caregivers bring to the table? And this is what I call the universal ingredient. Um, and, and really the universal ingredient is caregiver speech. Next slide. So we now have over 30 years of scientific evidence that indicates that quantity and quality of caregiver speech is positively associated with child language skills. So what do I mean when I say that? What I mean is that children that hear more caregiver speech go on to have better language skills. This um, was a, findings were originally published in the early 1990s by Janelle Huttenlocker and then later by um, a seminal study by Betty Hart and Ted Risley. But it's been replicated more than 10 times since then. Um, over and over again, we find this same pattern of association. Some of this research has actually been done by our very own Dr. Owen and her collaborators. And I call it the universal ingredient because these studies have been done in not just one sample of children, but in a variety of different samples of children. So we found this pattern of association between caregiver speech and better language skills in typically developing children, in Spanish-speaking children from low-income homes, in white and black children from low-income homes, 
in children with brain injury. This is actually a, a body of research that our Dean, um, Dean Small, recently brought to my attention, so thank you for that, and in children with autism. So it really does seem to be the case that in every population that we look at, caregiver speech and the amount and quality of caregiver speech is supporting early language development in kids. So since this is sort of a well-established finding in the literature, researchers have recently been shifting focus a little bit and trying to understand which types of caregiver speech best support language development, and also if there are any parental factors that predict how much parents will talk to their infants. Next slide. So this idea of parental factors that influence caregiver speech was um, originally sort of brought to the attention in, in a seminal study that I've already mentioned by Hart and Risley. And this research came out of the 1960s war on poverty. And the aim was to mitigate the effects of poverty and educational outcomes. And um, the, the researchers Hart and Risley first did a study at the Turner House Preschool where they provided high quality education to children from a variety of different socioeconomic backgrounds. So in, in their studies, it's often based on um, occupation, but other studies look at income or educational attainment as well. And what they found was that when kids were in this high quality preschool, they were showing good gains in their language skills, right? So they were catching up in their vocabulary where we, we weren't seeing these same effects related to poverty. But the downside of this research was that as soon as the kids were out of the preschool and were um, going on to kindergarten, all the effects washed out, right? So they were no longer seeing these same gains in vocabulary, especially in the children that came from lower SES backgrounds. So they asked themselves, like, what is going on here and how can we understand this and how can we make a better positive impact in children's lives? And their solution was to go into the homes and to look earlier than even uh, preschool and kindergarten. And so what they did was they crafted a study that includes three groups based on parent occupation as a proxy for socioeconomic status or SES. So they had a low, middle, and high SES group. They um, recorded in the homes every month for over two years in these families, generated an incredible amount of data. And then they were they did um, transcriptions of all the recordings. So the students in my labs that now have to do <laughs> transcription and annotation, I promise you it could have been worse because we don't transcribe nearly as much data as they did for this study. And so when um, they looked at this data, what they found was that by the age of two, the high SES kids heard 30 million words more than the low SES kids. And that's what you're seeing on the left part of this infographic here that I've, um, I've, I've borrowed from Get Georgia Reading. Um, and this, this finding was important, not just because there was this gap in the amount of caregiver speech that children were experiencing based on their socioeconomic background, but because the the amount of caregiver speech was related to um, later child language skills. So the high SES group actually had double the vocabulary of children from their lower SES group. Now it's important to note that all the kids in this study learned to walk and learned to talk, right? They developed by all accounts typically developing, um, but, and there is wide variation amongst the different groups, right? So what we're talking about here is sort of high level group differences. Um, but it was certainly the case that there are some um, parents from the low income group that talked to their children a whole lot and had kids that had um, really fantastic language skills themselves. Now, uh, the last thing that's of note to mention from the Hart and Risley study is that their, their findings on language skills at three years of age were actually predictive of language scores at age nine. Right, so these findings really had long lasting effects. Um, so the, the good news really is that often what we've learned in, in subsequent research studies is that caregiver speech is actually often a better predictor of how that child is developing in, term of, in terms of language skills than family SES, right? So in no way am I trying to say that uh, socioeconomic status is the end all and be all to how a child is going to turn out. We actually know from research, um, and this finding has also been replicated many times, that what the important piece is is caregiver speech.
Now, research that's happened since these original studies in the early 90s has started to focus less on what I call these distal factors like income, occupation, or education, and much more on these proximal factors. And I like the focus on these proximal, proximal factors because for many of them, they're also modifiable, which means that we can target them in a context of an intervention. So for example, we know that, um, that knowledge of child development is actually more closely and tightly associated with caregiver speech patterns than any of these SES variables that we talked about. Likewise, we also know that views on learning and intelligence are also more tightly related to caregiver speech patterns. And there's preliminary evidence coming out of, I think at this point now, two, um, two treatment studies that have shown that if you, so let me back up just one second and, and talk a little bit what I mean about views of, of learning and intelligence. So um, the, the views on, on intelligence are really related to this idea of a growth versus fixed mindset, okay? And if you have a fixed mindset, then the idea is that you think that intelligence is, is biological and innate and, in, and genetic and cannot be changed, right? So it is predestined in that regard. A growth mindset is the opposite of that, with the idea that um, children can learn new things, they can work hard, that that intelligence is not purely genetic and, and, and predestined. So what research studies have now shown is that if you have parents that come into a study with a fixed mindset and you teach them about a growth mindset, they both increase how much they're talking to their children and the quality of their speech to their children, but also their kids are the ones that have the most benefit from that in inter intervention, right? So some of these proximal factors really are modifiable, and we're starting to see this in research. Um, this work just needs to kind of be downward extended now into infancy, which is what part of my lab is trying to do. Some of these other proximal factors are important, but maybe not as modifiable, like material hardship, household chaos and maternal depression and maternal stress. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't study these things, we should, and it could provide us with some interesting um, ideas on how to best formulate interventions and treatments for families, but we may have a, a little bit harder time modifying things like um, maternal depression than we would necessarily of views of intelligence, for example. So what I want to do now is sort of switch gears a little bit and talk to you about some of my own research and how the studies that I just spent the last um, 10 minutes or so talking about really informed my, my, my own research and how I wanted to apply these findings into the work that I do in autism spectrum disorder. Next slide, please. So um, high level overview here, um, autism spectrum disorder is a lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder. The current rates are somewhere around one in 54 children that are affected by autism. Core features of this disorder include deficits in social communication and social interaction and the presence of repetitive and stereotype behaviors. Um, the average age in America is currently right around four years of age, although clinically reliable diagnoses are available much earlier than that, around two years of age. And we wanted to ask this question about, is caregiver speech um, supporting early language development in children with autism? And in part because they, we know that these children have these challenges with social communication and social interaction, right? So if you have a child that's struggling in that domain, are they able to still benefit in the same ways from rich and responsive caregiving and high quality um, caregiver speech? But we didn't wanna do this in four-year-olds and we didn't wanna do it in two-year-olds. We wanted to do this study in babies, which really made our lives a little bit harder. Um, so to, to overcome that feat, we used a very clever research design called the baby sibling study. Next slide. And this is work that I do um, as, a, as part of the infant brain imaging study. This is um, the, the foundation of the postdoctoral work that I did at UNC um, with Joe Piven, who's the principal investigator of the network, and it's work that my lab is continuing to be involved in as well. So in this study, um, we really are lever leveraging the genetic vulnerability for autism, right? So 
one in 54 people from the general population will go on to have autism, but we know that autism tends to run in families. So if a family has a child with autism and then they have a subsequent baby, that baby actually has a 20% chance of having autism, which is high, much increased than what you would find in the general population. So if you wanted to look at, look at autism in infancy in the general population, you'd be doing this study with thousands of babies. Um, if you use this high familial risk design, you only have to do it with hundreds, which is also no small feat, but that's what we do. Um, so in this study, we have two groups of families that are recruited in when they have very young babies. So we recruit them in before they're six months of age. And in our high familial risk group, this is infants that have an older sibling with autism. But again, um, these are just, just babies that there's no concerns necessarily about autism. They're just babies that um, have been subsequently born after a family has had a child with autism. Um, as I said, 20% of these infants do go on and have autism themselves, 80% do not. And then we have a control group um, that we call our low familial risk group. So these are babies that have typically developing older siblings. And we see what you would expect in the general population with this group. So about one and a half percent of them will go on and have autism themselves, about 98.5 do not. Um, so that's kind of the, the high level overview of the research design. Um, and next slide, please. So we wanted to measure if caregiver speech was supporting early language skills in these babies that were going to go on to have autism and the other infants in our study as well. And so to do this, we collected two days of home language recordings at nine and 15 months using these Lena home language recorders. They're about the size of a credit card and weigh a few ounces, and they're paired with specifically designed clothing. So you can see that in the lower figure on the, on the right here. So the children wear these little jumpers or t-shirts where you just kind of pop the recorder in, turn it on, and it records everything that the child hears and says for a 16 hour period. The software is then, or the hardware rather, is then paired with software that automatically generates daily counts of infant vocalizations, and these are speech-like vocalizations specifically, so babbling and words, adult words spoken to or near the child, and infant and adult conversational turns. And this conversational turn measure is sort of our proxy measure for um, how much time the parent is spending interacting directly with the infant, right? So how much time is there reciprocal communication? Next slide. So we collected this data um, and we also collected data at 24 months to determine a diagnostic outcome for these kids. And also at 24 months, we, we measured their language skills using the Mullen scale, scales of early learning. We created a verbal developmental quotient, which kind of averages across their receptive and expressive language skills. Um, to, to familiarize yourself with the figure, let me just walk through it really quickly. So on the y-axis here, we have Mullen um, language skills at 24 months of age. And then on the x-axis, we have our caregiver speech measures, right? So the one on the left is for adult word counts at nine months. The figure on the right is for adult word counts at 15 months. And then what you're seeing is a scatter plot. So each of those dots represents one individual child in the study. And then the lines represent sort of group trends. And the groups are as follows. So the high risk ASD, which we have here in red, these are the infants that had an older sibling with autism, but also went on to have autism themselves. The high risk negative infants, they're in blue. And they're infants that had an older sibling with autism, but did not go on to have autism themselves. And then the low risk negative infants are the infants that had a typically developing older sibling and were typically developing themselves. And what you see is that the, the group trend lines are all kind of in this upward trajectory, right? They're at a diagonal. And what that tells us is that across all of the infants in our study, irregardless of diagnostic outcome or group membership, hearing more caregiver speech was associated with better language skills, right? So this pattern was universal across all the kids in the study. Um, on the figure on the right, you don't see the trend line for the high risk negative because it's right under the, the black line, which represents sort of the average across all the infants. So it's there, it's just kind of peeking out and hidden a little bit. Um, next slide. So we also did a similar analysis using our conversational turn count measure, right? So this is every time that the infant vocalizes and the parent responds or vice versa. 
Um, so we're getting these kind of little baby conversations or met metrics of these baby conversations. And we think this is a better measure of speech quality. And we found a similar pattern of association here. So again, um, the y-axis is our Mullen language scores at 24 months of age, and the y or the x-axis is conversational turn counts at nine months on your left, 15 months on your right. And again, um, we see an overall positive association. So for infants that experience more conversational turn counts, they're more likely to go on to have better language skills themselves. And I think the thing, one of the things that stood out to me when I originally analyzed this data was that we're looking at caregiver speech at nine months and then language at 24 months. So this isn't concurrent, this is a predictive relationship in that regard. But again, you know, we see this kind of positive benefits conferred across all the infants in our study. In this sample, I often get a comment um, when I share this slide that the, the line for the high-risk ASD infants, the one in, in red, is a little bit steeper. Um, it's important uh, to say that the interaction term there that would measure if the slope of those lines across groups is, is different was not significant. It was like P of 0.1, so there is maybe some signal there and it could be a power issue. But if that were a true effect, what that would really be telling us is that actually what is the case is that for children with autism, they benefit even more from caregiver speech than the other children in the group. Again, we'll have to replicate this finding in a larger sample, which we're, we're hoping to do soon. Next slide. So because we based this research study on some of the, the foundational studies that, that had already been taken place in, in typically developing samples, we also wanted to ask the question about how parental factors were associated with caregiver speech patterns, right? So we've already shown that caregiver speech is associated with better language skills, but then we wanted to understand what, what factors um, related to the parents would, would be influencing how much they were talking to their kids. And for this study, we really only looked at these distal factors. So we looked at age, race, and education, both in the moms and the fathers. Um, and we didn't find any effects for age, so this is age at childbirth, excuse me. So we didn't find any effects for age or race. So for either of those two factors, there was not a significant relationship to caregiver speech patterns, but we did find a significant relationship for parental education. And the effect was stronger in maternal education, but it was also present in paternal education as well. And next slide. So the way that we, we tested this is using a mediation analysis, and we won't get into the nitty gritty here, but essentially the question that we wanted to ask was, okay, so we know that maternal education is related to, to language skills in children. That's something that's been um, found in previous studies for the last 30 years. Um, but we wanted to know is if it's really the case that maternal education is related to how much parents are talking to their children, which in turn is related to later language skills. So when we put this top of the, the, the triangle here in place, the adult word counter, the conversational turn count measures, which are both our measures of caregiver speech, if we put those into the mix, then do you still see this association between maternal education and later child language skills? And what our mediation analyses showed was that um, we did not. So it was actually the case in our, in our data, at least, that maternal education is significantly associated with caregiver speech, which in turn is significantly associated with later um, child language skills. In these analyses, if folks are wondering, we put all the infants into, into one model together. We did include diagnostic outcome as a covariable, but we didn't see any notable changes in the model when we did that. Next slide. All right, so for me at least, um, what are the future directions? Well, the future directions are, are on one hand, really looking at these modifiable factors that influence caregiver speech. So the work that I do in my research lab is always um, with the sort of end goal of thinking about how we can inform treatment or public policy practices or interventions. So we wanna understand what are the factors related to parents that are most strongly related to caregiver speech patterns? And are those factors something that we can actually modify in the course of an intervention study? So we're right now recruiting infants um, from the DFW area that are um, under six months of age, that are typically developing. 
and um, parents are filling out a number of questionnaires and we're sending home home language recordings with them. Um, and so we're going to start to get some of these answers hopefully in the next couple of years. Um, as a neuroscientist, I of course can never resist the urge to put a baby in an MRI scanner, which is what you can see in the picture of the right here. And um, so we looked preliminarily at this question of does caregiver speech actually impact infant neurodevelopment? And the, the super preliminary evidence suggests that yes, it does. That we do see some evidence that um, caregiver speech is related to infant brain development. I have two talented graduate students in the lab right now, Sharni and Kat, who are following up on this preliminary report, and hopefully they'll have some more solid answers for us in the next um, year. Um, next slide. And then one just quick plug for the infant brain imaging study in the IBIS network, just because I'm, I'm so proud of the work that we do. And I didn't talk about the work that we do related to early identification, uh, but that's really the, the, the main aim of that research network. And we were fortunate to be highlighted in a National Geographic article this year, which is a tremendously cool experience, I think, for everybody. Um, so this is a picture from the article, and the article is titled Finding Early Signs of Autism. So if you're interested in this line of research, um, I encourage you to look it up. If you're at UTD, we actually have a subscription to National Geographic. If you're not and you want to see the article, send me a message now. I'll more than happily send it along to share it, share, share it forward. Um, next slide. So in the, in the last um, few minutes of my talk, I want to go over some recommendation for parents, right? So we've talked about how babies learn language, what the milestones are, what are the, some of the factors that contribute to that development. But at the end of the day, we all want to know how we can support the babies that we encounter in our everyday lives, if they're our own or our cousins or kids in daycare or in practice that we, we find. Uh, next slide. So to that end, um, I'm going to share with you all um, what's called the five steps for brain building, serve and return. And this is from the Harvard University Center on the Developing Child. And we'll be sharing a link to this at the, at the end of the talk and as well on the CCF website. After the talk, I'll be, hand, I'll be providing a handout to folks that will also include the link there. So in this, um, uh, in this framework that they're operating under here in, in this five steps, what they acknowledge is that this adult-child relationship that's really responsive and attentive, that includes lots and lots of back and forth, that builds a strong foundation for child's brain development and future learning and development, including language skills. And they call this the serve and return because the idea is that it takes two to play, right? So step one is noticing the serve and share the child's focus of attention. So if your child is looking at something or pointing at something, are they making some weird facial expression? <laughs> um, are they even just when they're really little kind of moving around their arms and legs? That's what we call a serve, right? It's an opportunity to engage with your infant. And the key is to pay attention to where the child is focusing their attention. Now, <laughs> granted, you can't spend all your day doing this, right? Like that would be exhausting. <laughs> so what I recommend for parents is that they find small opportunities throughout the day to, to create these opportunities. So that could be during diaper change or when the little one, you're getting the little one dressed, maybe during feeding, or if you're waiting in line at the store. So um, this is important. This piece about, about sharing the child's focus of attention is particularly important for young infants and in, in infants and toddlers with neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, because it can be quite difficult for little ones to redirect their attention to you, right? So if you focus on what they're attending to instead of trying to redirect their attention, you may have greater success of what we call periods of joint engagement. And this is just times when both you and the baby are looking at attending to the same thing. And what we'll see in these next steps is that those periods of joint engagement are really the foundation for language learning. Next slide. So um, when you see the serve, you can return the serve by being supporting and encouraging. So you can offer comfort with a hug and gentle words. Um, you can simply just acknowledge what they're looking at. You can make a sound or a facial expression. Um, you can even just say, I see that, um, and, and let them know that you're cueing into what they're paying attention to as well. If it's an object that's close by, you can bring it close to them so they can take a quick, a closer look at it. 
And this sort of um, this framework of really being supportive and responsive here is both rewarding your child's interest and curiosity, um, but you're also just providing a secure attachment environment for them, right? Because the child is seen and heard and um, is feeling very kind of um, loved and understood in that moment. Next slide. This is probably my favorite step. So step three, given a name. Um, so when you return a serve um, to whatever it is that the child is looking or seeing or doing, you can make really important language connections to their brain by naming that thing, right? So in this example, the little girl has picked up a pepper um, and the mom is probably gonna comment on the pepper, like, oh, that's a red pepper. Now, this child is gonna have an easier time creating a label map for red pepper than she is for uh, this yellow or orange pepper because she's looking at the red one, right? So instead of the mom redirecting her attention to something else or picking up a cucumber, she's commenting on what the child is paying attention to and providing a label for it. And that's a crystal clear opportunity for a child to learn the name of an object. Next slide. So step four is take turns and wait, keep the interaction going back and forth. Now, this is a lesson that I actually learned um, early on in my doctoral studies. I, I started working on an early intervention project um, that we were delivering in New York City going into families' homes. Um, it was a study of toddlers with autism. And um, one of the kind of key things that I learned was just to be patient and quiet and sometimes let children have a moment, right? So we need to remember that babies and children don't process thing at the same process information at the same rate that we do as adults, right? It takes them a little bit longer. So sometimes you need to just kind of give them that breath and that space. Um, so some and for people that have a hard time with this or like, you know, are not comfortable with the awkward silence, sometimes we would even teach people to like count in your head silently to a few seconds. So you give the child the opportunity and the space to, um, you know, give you another serve. Um, or to keep the interaction going and to stay in that period of joint engagement. The emphasis or the, the inclination should not be to like jump to the next toy right away just because they haven't responded immediately. Sometimes we just need to kind of wait and sit in that moment for a second. All right, next slide. So step five um, is practice endings and beginnings. Um, so children are pretty darn good at signaling when they're ready to move on with something, right? So all we have to do is pay attention. And anybody that's worked with toddlers knows that when they throw a toy across the room or at you, it probably means that they're done with it. So that's a really clear signal. Sometimes the signals aren't as clear, so we need to pay a little bit more attention. So this is just about, this last step is just about um, paying attention to your child to see where they're going with the interaction. And in generally speaking, this sort of approach of that, that the center on the developing child is laying out is one where we, we follow the lead of the child and we, we pay attention to, to what they're looking at and comment on what they're looking at. But that doesn't mean that we always follow a child's lead, right? It's also important for us as adults to provide structure to children. So while we should try to make time to, to follow their lead, there may be times when we actually do need to kind of step in and help curate a play opportunity or help um, move on to a next activity. But generally speaking, um, paying attention to, to how their attention is changing throughout um, times when you're playing with them or when you're standing in line with them at, um, at the grocery store. Uh, next slide. And then really quick, um, I just want to put this slide up there and just spend a couple of minutes talking about the different types of caregiver speech that can best support language at different ages for infants, right? Because I get this question oftentimes from people, like, how should I be talking to my baby? And and I think that, you know, just talking to like if you're if you're thinking about this, that's a good thing and you're ahead of the curve already. So that's wonderful. Um, but if you want to kind of go even deeper, you can think about the sorts of language that you're using when you're talking to children. So when babies are pretty little before six months of age, we know that infant directed speech, which is really baby talk, right? This, this sort of speech that we, we, it, we can uh, really readily identify elongated values. It's very sing-song in quality. It's the way that we talk to babies. And if you're like me, you also talk to your dog this way. 
Um, so at zero to six months of age, infant directed speech um, and contingent responding, there's actually some very cool evidence from brain imaging findings showing that infants can better um, attend to, to people talking to them if they use infant directed speech than if they use uh, just what we call adult directed speech, which is just the way I'm talking to you now. And then when infants get a little bit older from six to 18 months, this is when their gesture use starts to, to uptick. So they may point to objects and label. Um, so this is what we're, you know, and this is part of what we were talking about in the, the, the Harvard um, five steps of, you know, following their point, um, labeling objects, but also likewise by this age, they're, they're reasonably good at following your directed attention sometimes. <laughs> so you can also point things out to them as well. Um, it does help if there's sort of a situation where it's a parent and then or a caregiver and the baby and just one object that you're sort of looking at, they have more success in, in those sorts of situations. Um, but again, this sort of labeling objects that kids are pointing at or attending to is just a wonderful way for them to learn language. And then when we get to 18 to 36 months, this is when increasing the diversity in your vocabulary is important and when um, WH questions, so who, what, why, when, um, using this sort of language can help expand vocabularies for infants. Um, so, you know, they've already really mastered things like gestures um, and parents get better at contingently responding to their kids at this age. So really we're kind of upping the game here by supporting their, um, the diversity of the, their vocabularies by using this sort of speech. Um, and using these sorts of WH questions also just encourages conversations with little ones to go on a little bit longer. Um, so that also just provides good learning opportunities. And then last but not least, I do recognize that babies grow up past 24 months and even 36 months, even though that's not the ages that I study. Um, but after 36 months, um, using speech that includes both the past and present tense and having children tell stories is a wonderful way to encourage um, language learning in little ones. And then just a quick note here at the bottom, I think that book reading um, can be used as a wonderful way at all ages to learn language and to support early communication skills and to support that early attachment relationship. So really it's never too early to, to engage in book reading and it's never too late with your kids. So you can use book reading at all these different time points to support early language and communication in little ones. And then next slide. So before um, I, I take questions, I do just want to acknowledge um, the families that have participated in the studies, both ongoing and previously. We do these longitudinal studies and ask parents to stick with us for their first two years of their infant's life. And some of them, we even ask them if we can put their babies in MRI scanners and they trust us and they stick with us. And that's the only way that we can do this research. So thank you for the families for that. And then on the left is just a picture of my research lab at here at UT Dallas, the, the baby brain lab. And on the right, is a picture of the Infant Brain Imaging Network, this phenomenal group of um, academics and researchers that I'm, I'm very honored to be a part of. And then just some contact information and an acknowledgement of the funding. And then I am ready for questions. Oh, thank you, Megan. Um, I wish we could hear applause, but we can't. <laughs> but we know there are a lot of you guys out there because there's lots of questions. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. So. Um, I'm sure we won't get to all of them, but there are a number that I have published and there are others as well. So um, here's one. Can you clarify what you count as caregiver speech? Is it just spoken words to the baby or do things like singing count or background music or conversation, gestures? Where are you, what are you counting? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when we talk about caregiver speech, we're talking about spoken language to the child, but that could also include singing. It doesn't include um, background conversations or sort of a TV or, or some sort of electronic media. So what we know is that really when, when caregivers are directly talking to their infants, that's when they learn language the best. So singing, talking, book reading, any of those things kind of count. Um, a child watching a video on um, YouTube is is not quite the same thing. I know one thing that you can't count are gestures. 
But if you're gesturing about something that's a shared focus of attention, shouldn't that also be contributing early, early as well? Yeah, so so does it contribute early in beneficial ways? Absolutely. Is it something that we measure sort of with our research and our home language recordings? No, right? So yeah. so yeah, so there are other things that, that also would benefit early language development. We're just not tapping into those in some of the metrics that we use. Okay, and, and here's another sort of uh, study question, and I think you covered this, but it'd be good to reiterate uh, this this person said, I've heard some commentary against the use of the 30 million word gap study in that the sample was too small, the study was racially biased. Is it still considered a valid source of data for us? Uh, yeah, that's a tricky one. And this was something that was sort of at the top of mind for a lot of people in the field last year because there was even more kind of criticism of that early work. and. I would say that yes, it's still a valid source point. So um, are there limitations to the work? Absolutely, right? So it's not a lot of families. Um, how they created their socioeconomic status groups had its limitations. So there's a limitation there. I think the important thing to keep in mind is that studies that have been published since then have addressed some of these concerns, both in terms of sample size, but also in terms of race, right? So is it problematic if, for example, your low SES group happens to be all the ethnic minorities and then your high SES group is a bunch of white moms with PhDs? Yes, that is problematic and it is not good research design, right? But studies that have happened since Hart and Risley's um, initial study have addressed those um, methodological limitations and have found that there's still this relationship between caregiver speech and later child language skills and also that at the at the highest level we do see kind of distinctions between socioeconomic status and how much parents are talking to their kids but yeah fantastic question thank you for that okay um, there was something related to that, I think asking about uh, studies, and you may have also just said that, in different, with um, caregivers speaking different language, um, Spanish speaking caregivers, for example. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So I think, Margaret, that's probably a question for you and not me. <laughs> um, but but yes. yeah, I, I think that there's been more, the most research kind of outside of the English language has been in Spanish speaking families. Um, but this research is now starting to kind of also be done outside of just um, the United States of America and other sorts of um, uh, communities as well, and and the 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 general trend kind of holds true. So so I do think that in the last thirty years since this original study has been published, there's been um, work that has a, addressed kind of that limitation as well. But again, um, I think considering culture is always an important part of the conversation and should be something that is um, acknowledged and th this approach is pretty kind of Eurocentric or Western centric. And I think that if we're talking about groups that are not from um, the sample size that we're studying, we need to be mindful of, of saying that these things are um, the end all be all for all babies and all communities and all cultures. Okay, I, I know we're running out of time and there are different kinds of questions here. Um, have you looked at any impacts with baby sign language? Is it helpful with language development in addition to communication? Well, that's a form of communication. In addition to <laughs> spoken language, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think that there, there's nothing wrong with using baby signs. I think that, you know, it, it probably works for some families and not others, and some kids kind of take to it. But there's no downside to that, right? So baby signs are just gestures. Right, essentially, and we know that gestures are really good for um, communication development. So, yeah, I wouldn't ever discourage the use of baby signs. Um, I don't think it's something that a family has to do in order for a child to have kind of optimal language development, but it certainly doesn't hurt if it works for that family. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, there's some general questions here, and one that I'm going to tell you to redirect to the Center for Children and Families. So there, there are questions about um, recommendations for an ASD diagnostician, and you can send that to Dr. Swanson. You can also send that to the Center for Children, children and Families. You can also send it to Calier Center. Um, so 
you can redirect that question through email to us. Um, also, uh, they folks want to know if the slides, if the talk, recording of the talk will be posted. The answer is yes on the CCF, the Center for Children and Families website, ccf.utdallas.edu. Um, a copy of this talk and the slides and I believe a handout uh, from this lecture will all be posted. I also want to point out that um, uh, Rachel has posted a link to an evaluation of the talk. We um, treasure these evaluations. They give us ideas for new talks, ideas for uh, new places to go and uh, suggestions and feedback. We welcome it, but so please give us your feedback. Um, I think, though, we're out of time. Am I right? I we guess. are, unfortunately. I'm, I'm looking at an old-fashioned watch here. <laughs> so, um, there's also interest in the article you mentioned, so we might find a way to get that posted on the website as well. Um, Absolutely. So, um, I wish I knew who was here. I wish I knew how many of you were here, but I thank all of you for your attendance and um, very much want to thank Megan Swanson um, for a great, very stimulating talk. We have other good, good questions too, so we'll see how we can address those. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure is mine. Thanks. Bye guys. <laughs>